This video is sponsored by Skillshare, an online learning community where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. Thousands of classes on lots of topics. More on them in a bit. It was once the tallest dam in the entire world. At the time it was built, the Hoover Dam was an engineering project the likes of which the world had never seen. Even today, its stats are impressive. Standing at 221 meters high, the dam contains over 3.3 million cubic meters of concrete. Its turbines can generate 2,080 megawatts of power, serving 1.3 million people. Numbers aside, its impact on the landscape has been beyond impressive. Lake Mead, modern Las Vegas, the flow of the mighty Colorado, all would be completely different or non-existent without the Hoover Dam. But how did this miracle of 20th century engineering come to be? What went into its construction? And where did the sheer mad vision for such a structure come from? Well, in the video today, we're going to be traveling back upstream through the river of time to an era of both hope and depression of dreams and disaster, and meeting all of the people who built America's engineering marvel. The story of the Hoover Dam is a story of many things. A story of America's 20th century rise, of Western expansion, of great engineering feats. But before it was any of that, it was the story of one river, the mighty Colorado. Running over 2,300 kilometers across the American Southwest, the Colorado is one of the great rivers of the world, comparable to the Danube in length and importance. But while the Danube was essential to the story of Europe's emperors and cities, the Colorado was essential to a very different civilization. It was near its banks that for millennia, Native American tribes like the Navajo made their homes. But this being the American West, that changed as soon as the 19th century rolled around. In the early 1800s, a trickle of European settlers began to move into the area around Colorado. When gold was discovered in California in 1848, that trickle became a flood. Long story short, the native tribes that had lived around the river were displaced, and the arid landscape became filled with predominantly white farmers. However, this created some problems. For centuries, the Colorado had been the most reliable freshwater source in the area, hence its popularity with native tribes. But it had also been the most reliable source of disasters. Seriously, if the Colorado were a sentient being capable of having hobbies, its number one hobby would have been bursting its banks and flooding the shit out of the place. So this created two interlinked issues. The first was the farmers needing the river's waters to irrigate their land and thus grow crops and not starve. The second was farmers needing that water to not flood everything and kill them all. For a while, the farmers tried to handle this themselves. At the turn of the 20th century, they dug canals and irrigation channels, hoping to tame the Colorado. Instead, they created the perfect conditions for their canals to burst their banks, which they did in 1905, sending so much water cascade into rural California that it created the Salton Sea. Clearly, improvised fixes were not going to be the way forward here. Luckily, Arthur Powell Davis had already figured this out. An Illinois engineer, David had taken part in a survey of irrigation systems in the Southwest at the end of the 19th century. What he'd seen had convinced him that the Colorado's problems required bigger fixes than canal digging farmers. It was Davis's report that had spurred the passing of the 1902 Reclamation Act, allowing for the building of dams to provide water out west under the supervision of the new U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, then known as the United States Reclamation Service. But Davis already had bigger ideas than just dealing with flooding. He wanted to harness the power of the Colorado itself, using a gigantic dam to generate enough electricity to power the western states. It was kind of a mad pipe dream. Although hydroelectric dams had been around since 1882, no one had ever dreamed of building one on such a scale before. Which may be why everyone ignored Davis's fruitcake idea. When the first major dams in the southwest began construction, they were big, but not colossal, engineering on a human scale. But this wouldn't last. In 1914, the Bureau of Reclamation got a brand new head. A guy known as, well, you guessed it, Arthur Powell Davis. And Davis still hadn't given up on his dream of harnessing the power of the whole Colorado. He was going to get his damn build if it killed him and, well, possibly everyone else. By 
By 1922, Davis was running full tilt at his hydroelectric windmill. A site, Boulder Canyon, had been chosen, and a plan had been presented to Congress to build a 200-meter dam that would stop flooding and generate electricity. Unfortunately for Davis, the states dotted along the Colorado treated his plan like it was made of anthrax. The problem was this. There were six states who used Colorado's water along with California. The Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, New Mexico, Arizona, and Nevada were all terrified that the dam would ensure everything went to California, leaving them literally high and dry. Since agreement seemed impossible, it's likely that the project would have stalled out had Davis not had one powerful man on his side. If you've ever wondered about why the Hoover Dam is called the Hoover Dam, just know that it wasn't named for Herbert Hoover, the 1929-1933 president. It was named for Herbert Hoover, the 1922 Secretary of Commerce. Before he got the commerce job, Hoover had been an engineer. He was still attracted to big projects. And in 1922, they didn't come much bigger than Davis's dam. That same year, Hoover invited representatives of all seven states to a meeting. There, he basically cajoled them, bullied them, and bribed them until they signed an agreement. What emerged was the Colorado River Compact, a formula for agreeing the division of water among each of the seven states. Not untypically, the compact failed to take into account that Mexico also used water from the Colorado, but, you know, when has Washington ever listened to Mexico? Still, the compact was something of a miracle of negotiation balancing the rights of seven very different states. Hilariously, though, Hoover exaggerated the amount of water each state would get by using a very wet year on the Colorado as his baseline. That meant most years the states wouldn't see anything like that amount. Still, the plan slowly gathered steam. As the 20s progressed, Boulder Canyon was dropped as the location, and the current site at Black Canyon on the Nevada-Arizona border was chosen. And here's a random but interesting fact that we couldn't really fit anywhere else in this video. Those two states are actually in different time zones, so when it's 9am on the Arizona side and the crew guys are starting work, on the Nevada side, the guys are still in bed. Pretty weird, huh? Anyway, by 1928, it had been decided that the dam would be a curved concrete gravity arch dam. Congress was on the cusp of passing the bill authorizing it when disaster suddenly struck. Just before midnight on March 12, 1928, another curved concrete gravity arch dam, the St. Francis Dam, failed. The resulting 50-meter-high wall of water caused death and destruction across California. North of 400 people were killed in what remains one of the worst engineering disasters in U.S. history. In the wake of the San Francis collapse, Congress froze the Hoover Dam, which was at this point known as the Boulder Dam. For the next six months, an investigation was held. Panic, meanwhile, gripped those who were living in the shadow of the new dam. If the collapse of a 60-meter-high dam could kill over 400, what could the collapse of a dam over 200 meters high do? Finally, in November 1928, the investigation reported back. It turned out it had been mismanagement that led to the St. Francis Dam failure, and the Hoover Dam was safe to be built. Still, Congress changed the requirements of the project, increasing the size of the spillway by 400% and stating that the dam would have to be constructed in extremely conservative fashion. That same month, they passed the Boulder Canyon Project Act. At almost the same time, the dam's biggest champion, Herbert Hoover, was elected president in a landslide. On December the 21st, Calvin Coolidge signed off on the dam's construction, authorizing $128 million in one of his final acts as president. Arthur Powell Davis's vision of a concrete bam off fording the Colorado had finally come true. Now, all they had to do was actually build the damn thing. But now, just before we get into the building, I want to take a moment to tell you about Skillshare. Now, I can't promise that Skillshare are going to give you the skills to be an engineer capable of building the Hoover Dam, but they can teach you a whole lot else. And honestly, you probably weren't looking to get into the dam building game, or if you are, please go get a degree in engineering or something. But for the rest of you who want to take the next step on your creative journey, there's Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community where millions come together and take the next step in their creative journey. Skillshare is an online learning community that offers membership with meaning. They've got thousands of classes for creative and curious people on topics from illustration to design to photography to video to freelance. And that's just scratching the surface. Skillshare offers classes designed for real life so you can move your creative journey forward without putting your life on hold. No one likes being put on hold. 
Unlike some websites where you have to pay for individual classes with a premium membership from Skillshare, you get unlimited access, so you can take as many classes as you wish. Now, I've previously mentioned some of the classes I've taken, but maybe you're into different things than me. They've got classes on interior design by Emily Henderson, something I don't know anything about, but I imagine my wife would love. Instagram-worthy photography by Brandon Wolfell, which is perfect for when I pursue my next career as a sexy Instagram model. Not really. Or digital poster design, because apparently there are such things as digital posters. Who knew? The first 500 of you guys to click the link in the description below will get two months of premium membership so you can explore your creativity. And then after that, it's very affordable, less than $10 a month if you get an annual subscription. And let's get back to the video. So here's the thing about building a gigantic dam in the middle of nowhere. You can't just turn up, pour some cement, and hope for the best. Before grounds could even be broken at Black Canyon, over a year had to be spent just preparing the site. It wasn't until September the 17th, 1930, that Secretary of the Interior Ray L. Wilbur drove a railroad spike into the ground, formally declaring the site ready. As he did so, he declared, I have the honor to name this dam after a great engineer who really started this greatest project of all time, the Hoover Dam. However, while this marks the first time someone official called the Hoover Dam the Hoover Dam, it wasn't officially known that way. By 1930, the whole of the USA was sinking deep into the Great Depression, a slump many thought Hoover's policies were making worse. Already naming the dam after the 31st president was almost as toxic as calling it the Kaiser Hitler Stalin ISIS Dam. On March the 11th, 1931, a consortium of six construction companies, imaginatively titled The Six Companies, won the bid to build the two named dam. And so, the greatest engineering feat the US had yet seen finally got underway. Almost immediately, it ran into problems, though. The problems weren't of a technical nature, as pretty much everything had been planned out. No, the problems lay further down the chain with the workers. More accurately, the workers were the ones who suffered the problems. Conditions on the Hoover Dam were abysmal. In summer, it could reach nearly 50 degrees Celsius, while in winter, it plunged below freezing. And that was just outside. The first part of the plan called for the construction of massive diversion tunnels to send the Colorado's waters running away from the site. Those working inside the tunnels experienced temperatures literally hotter than the Sahara Desert. But at least they had work. By 1931, the unemployment rate had topped 15% and was heading upwards. To put that in perspective, during the 2008 recession, unemployment didn't even hit 10%. By 1932, nearly a quarter of the U.S. workforce would be laid off. These workers were replaceable, and six companies knew it. You can see this most clearly in August 1931. That month, the dam's workers went on strike, demanding flushing toilets, access to cool water, and a promise that six companies would stop ignoring safety laws. Six companies basically responded by, well, in that case, I guess you're all fired. The laborers were back at work before a week was out. And so we get to the part of the video where the six companies do nothing but act like supervillains. Take Boulder City, a town the company built for its workers to live in. Life in Boulder City was pretty good. It had an ultramodern hospital, for example. But that hospital was only there for a cynical reason. When six companies signed the contract, they'd agreed to a tight time frame to finish the dam. Exceed it, and they'd be fined every single day until completion. With cutting corners on a giant dam both impossible and foolhardy, six companies instead chose to cut corners on workers' safety, trusting their new hospital to patch up the injured. From 1931 to 1935, dozens of workers were crushed, electrocuted, exploded, or simply fell to their deaths. Officially, the death toll stands at 96. However, dozens more died of pneumonia brought on by inhaling toxic gases. But six companies didn't count them in the statistics to avoid having to pay compensation. Despite what you've heard, though, none of the dead actually ended up inside the dam. That whole story of bodies buried in the concrete is just that. A story. Yet even this litany of death couldn't stop progress. By summer 1933, the diversion tunnels had done their job. The site was dry. Building the Hoover Dam could finally commence. There was just one problem. The dam's namesake was no longer around. On November the 8th, 1932, American voters threw Herbert Hoover from office in one of the greatest losses ever suffered by a sitting president. Despite winning in a landslide himself just four years earlier, Hoover was swept from office to make way for Franklin D. Roosevelt. 
Although historians these days tend to paint Hoover in a more sympathetic light, at the time he stepped down in January 1933, his name was Mudd. Yet down on the Nevada-Arizona border, the Hoover Dam kept right on being built. It's just that everyone now called it the Boulder Dam. On June 6, 1933, concrete pouring began a whole year ahead of schedule. Getting to this point so early had been a grim task. That summer, a worker had died every two days, by far the bloodiest period of the entire project. But now, the real work had begun. So before you go imagining a giant mixing machine pouring concrete in to fill up the entire dam in one go, you should know that this isn't what happened. Pouring the concrete continuously would have resulted in the shape being warped, so instead it was poured in individual blocks which were then fitted together. It was an absolutely huge job. Twenty men had to be employed full time purely to keep the surface of each block moist. To give you an idea of how so many blocks were poured, it said that the Hoover Dam was the largest masonry structure built by mankind since the Great Pyramids. At that point, we're not really sure if we're more impressed with 1930s America or ancient Egypt. Either way, pretty incredible job, everyone. While all these blocks were being laid, over 800 kilometers of pipes were being inserted into the dam itself to act as a massive cooling system. See, when concrete sets, it produces heat. With a structure this size, a helping hand was needed to get it all cooled and good to go as fast as possible. In the end, nearly 2.5 million square meters of concrete were used in constructing the Hoover Dam. And you want another random fact? The first summer spent pouring these blocks in the scorching sun was during the tail end of Prohibition. Those concrete pourers toiling in 50 degrees C heat couldn't even relax with a cold beer afterwards. Finally, on February 1, 1935, the first of the diversion tunnels were closed, allowing the Colorado to come surging against the lower parts of the dam. That moment, Lake Mead, the largest reservoir in the U.S., began to form. As the lake grew, the construction equipment left below began to be submerged. Rails, vehicles, shacks, they all sank beneath the waters, lost forever in the darkness. The last bucket of concrete was poured on May 29, 1935. Over two years ahead of schedule, the dam was finished. Well, technically. The powerhouse still hadn't been built yet, but, well, who was really keeping score? With Lake Mead still slowly filling and the mighty dam now bisecting the Colorado, a ceremony was held on September 30, 1935 to declare the dam officially open. FDR himself made a speech opening with, This morning I came, I saw, and I was conquered, as anyone would be who sees for the first time this great feat of mankind. In the following speech, he made damn sure not to call that great feat the Hoover Dam. By 1936, Lake Mead was full enough to start generating electricity. Come 1939, the dam was generating more electricity than any other hydroelectric dam in the world. In the following years, the Hoover Dam would change the face of the American Southwest. With water it provided, the electricity, the safety from flooding, communities were able to grow. Las Vegas, for example, was only able to grow to its current size thanks to this very dam. But the story of the dam, it wasn't over yet. And neither is this video. We've still got one final act left to go. For the first couple of decades after the dam's completion, it excelled not just at generating electricity, but also generating arguments. From pretty much the moment Herbert Hoover left office, the dam's name became a tremendous source of contention. Diehard conservatives still called it the Hoover Dam, while New Deal progressives insisted it was the Boulder Dam. By the time the dam was finished, what you called the biggest engineering feat in U.S. history was a good indicator of where you fell on the political spectrum. And since FDR would remain president right until 1945, that meant the Boulder Dam was its official name for 13 long years. All of that ended when FDR finally died in 1945. Two years later, Harry Truman threw the newly Republican-controlled Congress a sop by authorizing the name change. As Time magazine dryly reported, Merchants contemplating a quarter of a million dollars worth of ashtrays, sofa pillows, and other knickknacks emblazoned souvenir of Boulder Dam tried to decide what to do. They could get rid of them at a loss, but what if the next Congress were Democratic? In the event, the next Congress was actually Democratic, but with the Cold War now settling in, no one was any longer in the mood to argue about dams named after former presidents. What they were keen to argue about was water. Remember how we said Mexico got left out of the Colorado River Compact back in 1922? Well, it took until 1944 to get them included, and for the seven states to begrudgingly agree to send some water down south. 
But even then, it was controversial. The water that made it down was high in salinity, meaning it was absurdly salty, and it took until 1972 for Mexico to get the US to agree to construct some desalination facilities. Yet both these arguments were just peanuts compared to the crisis that was steadily brewing, one that wouldn't become apparent until the 20th century was already in the rearview mirror. So let's jump cut to the late 1990s. At that time, Lake Mead's surface behind the Hoover Dam was at 365 meters above sea level, one of the highest levels it's ever reached. In the years since, though, that level has declined and declined and declined. In 2013, the water level fell so low that the lake could no longer be called the largest reservoir in the U.S. By 2019, the LA Times reported that the water level had fallen to nearly 320 meters. This is important because 320 meters is the magic level whereby Lake Mead can generate electricity. Fall below that, and the dam doesn't generate any power. Fall much further below that, and it can't provide any water. Although early 2020 saw some improvements in water level, the decline seems to be a long-term problem, making some wonder, well, what could be done? The answer lies in an engineering project nearly as impressive as the Hoover Dam itself. In 2018, the city of Los Angeles proposed spending $3 billion to create a huge solar pumping system that would send water from downstream of the dam right back up into Lake Mead. The idea is to ensure that Lake Mead has a constant supply, one that's not limited by the Hoover Dam's own ability to use water or what the grid is doing at any given time. Were the project to go ahead, it would be one of the great engineering challenges of our time. It could be completed as early as 2028. We're not here to endorse this project, it's way too complicated to completely unwrap, and it affects an area that none of us live in, so, well, there's that. But the idea does at least show that the Hoover Dam isn't just a monument. It isn't just a technical marvel of 85-odd years ago, good for a few photos and nothing more. This is still an active, evolving miracle of engineering, and it could be about to get even more miraculous. All of those who dreamed up, commissioned, and built the Hoover Dam are long since dead. But their vision lives on, bringing energy, water, and life to the American Southwest. We can't say for sure what the future will bring, but it wouldn't surprise us if 100 years from now, people are looking at the souped-up new Hoover Dam, and just like those who first laid eyes on it in 1935, are wondering in awe at the things mankind is capable of. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos just like this twice a week currently, sometimes a little bit more. Hit that notification bell so you find out when we do put out a new video. And thank you for watching.